All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest and author with a recent book. His name is MJ Benias, and he has written a book titled The UFO People, A Curious Culture, published April 9th, 2019. I read the book. Uh, Mr. Benias is an educator, author, and blogger. His popular blog, Terra Obscura, critically examines how philosophy and culture affect society's understanding of anomalous phenomena, including, including UFOs. And he was a former member of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. And his website is mjbanias.com, M-J-B-A-N-I-A-S.com. And we're going to talk about uh, this fascinating subject, a very timely subject that's all over the current culture. So, Mr. Benias, are you there? I'm here. Thank you so much for having me on. This is really exciting. Cool. And I'm glad that uh, you agreed to the interview. So, for people who don't know your name and your background, can you talk a little about about yourself and how you became interested in the subject? Sure. My interest is, is was actually it all started off purely as as, as academic. Um, I have never had a, a paranormal or, or UFO experience. I was just someone who's always been interested in culture and and, and subculture. Um, so in university, that was sort of my my academic background was was studying critical theory, literary theory, and, and cultural theory. Um, so, so that's kind of how it began. Um, I, I quickly realized after I began speaking to people within sort of the paranormal world that, that, you know, various subcultures existed. So it sort of piqued my academic interest and, um, I, I kind of started talking to more people. I decided to get my hands dirty and become an actual UFO investigator purely just to meet, you know, UFO people. Um, and, and quickly I realized actually that, that the subculture was, was incredibly diverse. It was cr- incredibly nuanced and, um, it, it sort of formed a, a really strange community of people and a really strange subculture and not strange in, in the sense that they're different or weird, but strange in the sense that it didn't really fit or jive with other subcultures that, that I've studied. So, um, that's sort of how it all began for me. Um, you know, I, I investigated UFO sightings. Um, I, I wrote the blog. Um, I met a lot of people, made a lot of friends in the community. Um, and now here we are seven or yeah, seven years later, um, still, still talking UFOs, still writing about UFOs, kind of becoming, um, you know, a, a member uh, of this little world. It's kind of shifted my perception of stuff, but um, yeah, that's kind of how it all began for me. And you are located in Canada, correct? So that was kind of where you made your tra- travels out to investigate sightings. Yes, yeah, I, I'm in Canada. Um, I, I did have the opportunity to travel to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, uh, to sort of study the Mothman a little bit. That was a lot of fun. But it was, yeah, predominantly in, in Canada is where most of my, my UFO research occurred. Um, but that, the thing with the internet now is, is you know, you can talk to people and, 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 and get stories from, from all over the world. So the book kind of focuses on, on where I live in Manitoba, uh, in Canada, but then it jumps to people all over the world. So, um, it, it was, yeah, it's been an interesting experience. Let's put it that way. Gotcha. And I mean, you definitely have had communication with many of the experts in the field, many of the people other ufologists would definitely know in your communications um can you talk about how you kind of reached out and contacted people um one thing about people within the ufo community is that they're all very friendly and they're all very willing to chat um you know everyone wants i think to tell their story or, or give their perspective on this topic so for some of it it involved um just cold calls. Um, like in the case of Richard Doty, um, it was just a straight up cold call. Um, in the case of, of some other individuals, such as um, Dr. Christopher Kit Green, Hal Putoff, Dr. Gary Nolan, that was sort of a strange collection of events in the sense that I would reach out to one of them uh, and they would say, yeah, I'll talk to you. And then all of a sudden, you know, someone else would contact me and be like, oh, you should touch talk base or touch base with this guy. And then suddenly that guy would email me directly and be like, I hear you're asking about me. <laughs> it was that kind of odd, um, odd sort of communication and, and, and how we started chatting. Um, but once it all got settled, it, 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 it tended to work out. But yeah, a lot of interesting people, um, once you reach out to them, are, are more than happy to talk to you. And you've read, I mean, it wasn't just academics or people who had written books. You talk about going to see this woman, Amy, who was close to you, also contacted 
another guy who Roy, who you name Roy, mm-hmm. and Richard Doty. For people who don't know their name or his name, he's something of uh, of an infamous character. Can you talk about some of those people, Amy Roy and Richard Doty? Sure. Yeah. So so the book hinges around just just for people to to be able to I guess to to personalize it a little bit because it does get sort of a little philosophical and a little academic. I wanted to maintain a, a personal touch. Um, someone that that the reader could um, I don't know how to put it. Someone the reader could sort of you know I I I, I, I appreciate this person and and I can sort of follow their tale. Um, Amy was a, a UFO witness who's had many, many experiences uh, in, in sort of a short period of time, within about six years or so, um, has seen several UFOs, allegedly has had uh, a couple paranormal experiences. So, so she reached out through MUFON um, and, and I was put on her case to go investigate a UFO sighting for her. You know, unfortunately, as with most UFO cases or any paranormal case, you know, there's, there's not a lot of evidence for, for the investigator, it, it mostly boils all down to an anecdote. But uh, she, she was a very interesting person in the sense that she lived with her husband sort of on this farm in the middle of nowhere. Um, and, and she really gained nothing by talking to me and, and only lost um, because, you know, you kind of get known as the crazy person in town. So it was, it was nice to to sort of deal with someone who said, listen, I don't know what I'm seeing. I don't know what's going on. However, you know, I'm having these odd experiences and these odd sightings. Um, and, and not only that, she's a very kind person. She's very down to earth. She's just, you know, a normal human being and totally not what most people outside of the UFO community expect uh, a UFO witness to be, right? You know, in, in mainstream media, UFO people are sort of painted as tinfoil hat wearing kooky, crazy people. And, and Amy just isn't that. So I wanted to include her stories, and, and she was very generous in, in allowing me to do that, as well as sort of contributing a chapter to the book, um, sort of her her tales and odd, and odd encounters. Roy, on the other hand, who's, who's featured in the book, another chapter, um, it's not his real name, only because I, I, I've not been able to sort of track down Roy since we last spoke several years ago. Um, but he came to me with, you know, the traditional alien abduction sort of story and, and how it happened all the time. But as I met Roy and as I spoke to him more and more, I quickly realized that his life was in the process of, of collapsing and falling apart. His wife and son recently sort of left his life. They, they were separated and, and his son went with his wife. Um, he lost his job due to an injury. Um, so he was living on disability. He was on several medications for that, you know, for, for his injury. So it, it quickly sort of came down to me having to make a, a decision. Um, you know, was Roy actually having these experiences or was this sort of some sort of mental um, health issue that that he was experiencing due to depression and, and stress and, and, and trauma? Um, so I wanted to feature both of those kind of cases in, in my, my book. Because that that is the reality of, of the UFO sort of community. You have individuals who I would say are having sort of strange, anomalous, objectively real experiences, but you're also having individuals who are suffering from a, from delusion or or hallucination at times, or straight up trauma that is and, and the, the the UFO phenomenon is being used as a sort of cover for that trauma. So I wanted to have both of those sort of stories interwoven because I think it's a, a vital aspect of of the phenomenon itself and the community itself. And I agree. And I mean, you use some of these terminology that I think is perfect for the description of the UFO people, which is they believe in aliens, but they're also alienated. So it's almost like they're different. But also in Amy's example, she's having not just UFO sightings, she's having paranormal and supernatural events. So you, there is... It's not as, I mean, and you describe it in, throughout the book is like these UFOs not necessarily are um, some kind of extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial being. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm a bit of an agnostic in the sense that I, I haven't really thoroughly or, you know, properly chosen where I stand yet. Um, but I'm, I'm starting to lean towards that, you know, maybe the, the, the UFO phenomenon is, is a part of a, of a larger 
process. Um, it's a symptom of, of, a, of a larger disease, I suppose. And I, I don't want to use the term disease in a negative way, but it's just, you know, it's a thing, mm-hmm. a larger phenomenon, let's say. Um, and, and maybe all paranormal events are, are somehow connected um, and they just sort of manifest in different ways. That's my current hypothesis. I, 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 I'm told, I could be totally wrong, though. It's just an opinion, I guess. But yeah, the book kind of tends to focus on that asking different questions. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, are we dealing with UFOs that are that are alien from another planet or are they interdimensional or perhaps some larger system um, in in sort of more paranormal kind of universal paranormal sense? Um, yeah. So in, in regards to Amy's encounters, um, she does run the gamut. It's a sort of a like a wastebasket problem. Um, you know, everything's kind of shoved in the wastebasket and, and it doesn't make sense, but it's all in there. Um, right. So, that, yeah, I think that that was used by another uh, ufologist is this uh, there's so many things going on i mean she had had the ghost story of the woman on the porch was pretty scary so uh yeah. you know it was uh it is interesting that these these people are having multiple issues but what uh there and you also kind of let's see you also i mean before we get to doty can you talk about kind of the gender issues that are within ufology you spent a, ta- a, ch- a chapter talking about that yeah so um there was a series of studies done in the late 90s, early 2000s um, by a, a, a scholar. She's a religion and, and sort of philosophy anthropologist prof. Um, her name is Brenda Denzler. She's, she's terrific. And she she went to several conferences and, and did some just general number statistical um, data collection on, on who was attending, who was speaking. Um, and, and, and she quickly found that the vast majority of, of people involved in the UFO community are male and they're predominantly white. Um, and, you know, they're the ones willing to talk about and sort of be experts, quote unquote, on, on UFOs and aliens and all that stuff. Um, where, where women don't typically do that, women fall into the more the, the abductee, contactee category where they're talking about their personal experiences with ufos or, or aliens or the paranormal um, and they're talking about how, how it affected them personally but they're not sort of reaching out into that sort of expert level of, of i can talk about ufos in general for example um and and what i quickly found as i was doing research you know a year or two ago was the vast majority of women i spoke to within the ufo field um have, have all experienced some kind of of um i suppose you could call it gender discrimination um you know, the, the, the feeling that ufology is an old boys club um, is still very much alive and well in 2019. And, and female uh, researchers are, 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 are still sort of on the outside a little bit. Um, and, and it's all in the book, but I've, you know, I've got lots of um, anecdotal cases of, of paranormal and, and UFO investigators who, who talk about how, um, uh, you know, they're they're contacted by men within the community and very quickly the conversation turns and all of a sudden, you know, somebody sends them a dick pic um, or, you know, they're 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 told that, you know, their chapter in a book, um, you know, it, it's an excellent contribution from their gender and, and that type of thing. Right. There's sort of odd yeah. sexist remarks um, and 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 uh, harassment type behavior does does tend to exist. Um, so it's it's very um, it's unfortunate, but it's it's sort of I think again a, a, maybe a symptom of of the broader cultural landscape that we live in. Makes sense. And then you talk kind of about uh, this kind of psi or mundus imaginalis, this kind of perception mm-hmm. that's different. I mean, and I think that's a theme in your book is this kind of uh, specter of what ufology is or. Um, and can you talk a little bit about what your the concept of mundus imaginalis is? Sure. Um, there's a, a French philosopher. His name was Henry Corbin, if you're if you're English, or Henri Corbin if you're French. And um, he uh, he was a French philosopher who who started off very much as sort of all philosophers do, very Enlightenment era kind of um, you know Cartesian. There, there's a body and a mind, and that's it. Um, and and he had a I guess you could call it a, a sort of a strange experience um, where where he believed he was communicating with um, a long dead sort of ancient um, enlightened um, sort of Sufi master. Anyway, long story short, he went down the Fortean Road um, and he he started reading a lot of of um, more ancient philosophies, particularly Eastern philosophy. 
and tried to merge it with Western sort of imperialist and, and Western Enlightenment views. Um, and he came up with this notion of, of something called the Mundus Imaginalis, or in English we call it the Imaginal Realm. Um, and and the idea was 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 quite simple. There's the physical world around us that that you and I exist in. You know, the the microphone, the coffee cup, the laptop. You know, all these things. The table in front of you, the physical. Uh, and then he um, ex- sort of said that there's the intellectual world. That's the world of the mind, right? That's where your mm-hmm. ideas come from. That's where your sort of yourself exists. Um, the, the the world of of, of um, uh, uh, your thoughts. He, he then posited that, that there's this third realm that exists sort of in between the physical and the intellectual, and he referred to it as the imaginal. And the imaginal realm for, for Corbin was this place that was both physically real in that the stuff in it had actual mass and breadth and depth and, and it could, you know, it could be physical, but it was also um, uh, sort of partially from the intellectual world so so it was where your imagination came from it was where uh creativity came from it was where the strange things that that humans think about archetypes all that exist and he said that um the imaginal realm is kind of this this in-between world often when you when you go to sleep and you dream or 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 when you when you have um odd visions of strange things it comes from this imaginal world this in-between world of 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 the objectively physical and real and and the intellectual and it seems to really apply to this ufo because if you read at least for me reading some of the stories these things happen while somebody's asleep or waking up there's all so many themes of like sleep and awakeness or being alone and um yes and so it's it this i think you apply these Philosoph- philosophers and philosophical concept concepts really well to the UFO phenomenon. Yeah, I, I thank you very much. The the the, imag- the imaginal realm is an interesting idea because oftentimes, you know, within the paranormal narrative and then the UFO narrative, people often get affected by the paranormal when they're in this kind of in between zone, right? They're they're in what we call a liminal realm. This this um, they're in a period of flux or transition. Um, life isn't stable, but it's not incredibly unstable. It's kind of in between stability and instability that that weird stuff happens. This is why you know on, on those cheesy ghost TV shows, the ghosts seem to manifest when people are renovating their homes or or when somebody's going through puberty in the house. Right? It causes sort of paranormal events to occur. Right. Um, Corbin kind of said the same thing about the imaginal. It, it really manifests and it really kind of hits us in the face when we're in these positions of stress or we're in these positions of in-betweenness um you know we lost our job and we're looking for another job um we're 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 getting married and and we're moving house and and all this stuff that's when you know the the paranormal these these odd things tend to occur to us these strange moments of of um you know having odd gut feelings and they turn out to be right or 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 seeing something out of the corner of your eye that just kind of moved out of view and you could swear it was real but you weren't sure or you see a ufo or the mothman right that's these kind of so it's an interesting idea. I'm not necessarily saying it's totally true, but but I think it, it, it creates an interesting possibility for the UFO phenomenon as well as other paranormal phenomena. I think he, his philosophy kind of works in nicely. I totally agree. And then, uh, you know, maybe we could talk a little bit about this character you had contact with, Richard Doty, who seems to be a very important kind of uh, nemesis or villain within the UFO community. Sure. Richard Doty is um, a really infamous character. He um, he was uh, an Air Force intelligence officer. He worked for the Office of Special Investigations, which you could sort of say is mm, like the secret agents of the Air Force. Um, and they investigate. Um, they're, so they do work in intelligence gathering. They do work in counterintelligence. They're, they're like I said, the intelligence arm of the Air Force. And um he he worked at Kirtland Air Force Base in the the mid 80s, early to mid 80s, um, and and a, a gentleman who lived off the base. He was a a, a really smart guy. His name was Paul Benowitz. He was a I believe he was a an engineer and, and he had a background in physics and and he was um, kind of doing contract work for the government at times. Um, you know, just a generally a really well established smart guy. Um, was at home playing with his sort of ham radio system he had and and started picking up strange signals coming off the base. So 
um, you know, he contacts Kirkland Air Force Base and says, hey, you know, I'm at home and I'm picking up these weird signals and they're definitely coming from the airbase. So so obviously Kirkland Air Force Base security is like, uh, OK, so they sent Richard Doty and, and a few other officers to his house and figured out that Mr. Benowitz was was listening to secret um, classified sort of radio signals that were basically used to, to sort of ping satellites and 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 um, very early sort of raid uh, like radio radar systems that work with satellites and it was kind of a, a top secret project um, and they needed to ensure you know Paul Benowitz was not selling this information to the Russians or um, you know giving right. it away and, and and you know the Chinese were figuring it out or something so so you know Paul Benowitz was already kind of well involved in in um, UFO lore. Um, so I guess what happened was Richard Doty kept that alien lore kind of going with Benowitz. And, and very quickly, the Office of, of uh, Special Investigations and the Air Force said, oh, listen, Benowitz, he's, he's a nice guy. He's a patriot. He just bumped into it. Who cares? Tell him to stop listening. And that's it. And they kind of left it alone. Mr. Doty, um, whether he was acting on orders or not, he claims he was. Um, told Mr. Benowitz that, you know what, actually what you're hearing are alien signals because the Air Force is actively communicating with aliens um, and this is what's going on. He kind of fed them this whole story about extraterrestrials coming to Earth and and, and all this stuff. Well, it, it sort of drove Paul Benowitz mad uh, over several years and there was a long relationship between him and Doty where Richard Doty would, would take him to sort of places that, that he claimed there was alleged, you know, crashed flying saucers and, and their military people were working on them and basically Richard Doty became embroiled in the UFO community through Paul Benowitz and um, it, it led eventually to Paul Benowitz going mad um, barricading himself in his house uh, with a loaded pistol and um, basically screaming that the aliens were coming to get him and the government was going to kill him and all this stuff. Um, eventually his family intervened and, and he was institutionalized for about a year um, and, and he got better but uh, Richard Doty very quickly was painted as this disinformation agent who, who drove Paul Benowitz mad. And he was working with people within the UFO community to collect information on others within the UFO community. So it became this huge mythology of, of disinformation and government um, infiltration into the UFO community to, to throw it off track or to purposefully sow misleading information. So he became very quickly the bad guy of, of ufology. As one ufologist told me, he's the most hated man in all of you know UFO discourse. Um, so yeah, he's, yeah. he's definitely gotten a bit of a, he's been lionized and demonized, definitely and, for sure. And it seems like within the, the UFO people, it was interesting. You used uh, Benowitz as an adjective. You don't get Benowitzed, which is don't get psyoped or whatever and end up in a mental institution. Seems to be yeah. a common parlance or uh, known within that. And that was around the time about the MJ-12 documents, which some people think are still legit. Is that is that true or? Yeah, there, 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 there's some tr like, uh, yeah. So Richard Doty is is often blamed to to have authored them or been involved in authoring the MJ12 documents. You know, he he denies it, and I don't I don't necessarily believe that he was part of it. Um, but yeah, MJ12 was um, well, okay. There's there's two. <laughs> there's a there was a real majestic twelve program, um, but it was designed to study radiation. Um, after effects from let's say like a nuclear war or or if you know somebody was if they're testing nuclear weapons um you know how does the radiation affect um population groundwater whatever so so there was a real majestic 12 uh, sort of a group of scientists and politicians military top brass who were in charge of basically monitoring um how nuclear energy and, and the nu nuclear weapons would sort of alter the landscape of, of the world. And we have to remember, this was the 1940s and 50s where, where nuclear technology was still in its infancy. Um, so th there was a real MJ-12, and, and some of the documents associated with MJ-12 are those documents which are authentic. What, what occurred in the 1980s was this sort of whole batch of other MJ-12 documents coming out, the same names, the same people involved in the actual MJ sort of nuclear testing program came out and, and it had to, it, it totally distanced itself from the nuclear thing and said, that's just a cover. What we're actually dealing with is crash flying saucers that occurred in 1947 in the desert in New Mexico and Nevada. And, um, 
basically this group of people is tasked with investigating and reverse engineering and um, making alliances or communicate opening communications with the, the the extraterrestrials that crashed on planet earth um, and, and this was mailed to um, a guy named uh, Jamie Chanderay who 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 received them in the mail uh, as well as William Moore uh, and another uh, yeah, and William Moore, and they kind of got these packets of, of, of documentation, which over time were proven to be all fake. But, um, you know, Doty was involved in this. He was involved in this little collective uh, people believed in, in, in spreading this. And, and we now know that the MJ-12 documents are, are predominantly, you know, totally just made up. Made up yeah. um, but we're just not sure who did it. And that's why a lot of people point their fingers at Doty as being one of the um, main players in, in creating the MJ-12 documents. Right, and he was supposedly like the he had a code name Falcon or something like that. Wasn't that associated with MJ twelve as well? Yeah. So the the there was a UFO researcher named William Moore at the time, and he was one of the gentlemen who received the MJ twelve documents. Um, and he was working with a, a group of individuals that he dubbed or nicknamed the Aviary. Um, so uh, you know, sort of U.S. government insiders who. Uh, knew allegedly about the UFO question, or they were somehow loosely involved in it. So each member had the, a bird name. Um, so, you know, in my book, for example, I interview Hal Putoff and Dr. Kit Green. They were members of the aviary. I can't remember their names off the top of my head, but, you know, they were involved. But, you know, they were involved because they were just UFOs and they had they were CIA. Gotcha. But, and there, there you know, were, there uh, were rumors that Doty himself was financed by the CIA, that he was classified. Is that right? Yeah, there are there are yeah. So so Doty was known as Sparrow. That was his aviary name. Um and and most people believed that Falcon was um you know the head of the CIA at the time uh, Richard Helms. Um but but you know again people don't know that's that's what Doty claims. And and again nobody really knows who anyone totally is. Um you know there's been moments where Richard Doty was Falcon himself. Um so again it's all quite mysterious and shadowy and and I have to be honest it's, it's pretty nonsensical. But um D Doty um his files with the CIA are still classified, unfortunately. So we don't really know what Richard Doty was doing for the CIA. We don't know how he was involved with them. Um, so un unfortunately, we're, we're kind of stuck um, until those files become declassified. Um, we won't know the extent to which, you know, Mr. Doty's involvement with the CIA was it UFO related or was it not? You know, we know he did run counterintelligence operations in Germany. So, um, you know, in, in East Germany and West Germany. So, so maybe, you know, his CIA files closed because he was doing, you know, Cold War operations um, in, in Germany at the time. And that's what's classified. Gotcha. Or, but, you know, maybe the CIA was involved in some nefarious dealing with the UFO community. Maybe they were there just to mess around and, and muddy the waters um, because some people were getting too close to the truth or something. Right. We can go down that conspiratorial rabbit hole. And, and maybe part of his role was since he's already in the UFO community, it's easy for him to kind of infiltrate some more. You know, we, we don't know until that stuff gets declassified. We can only speculate. But, um, yeah, you know, there's been a lot of speculation that the CIA was involved. There's been a lot of speculation that the MJ-12 documents were totally fabricated by William Moore and Jamie Chandray to write a book um, uh, and, and it's just sort of make some money off of it. Um, it was sort of an opportunist game. You know, we're not really we're not really sure. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the people who, who know the truth have disappeared um, in the sense they just they, they left the UFO community and they've gone off. You know, nobody knows where they are anymore uh, or they've passed away. Interesting. And uh, can you talk a little bit about, about all of these kind of higher level academics you, you have a chapter that the Invisible College, um, Jacques Vallée, about these large group of individuals are doing high-level uh, inquiry, scientific inquiry into UFO phenomenon. Yeah, there's, um, you know, it, it's, it's long been kind of quietly known. Um, and actually, I recently wrote an article for Vice um, Motherboard uh, on this topic um, about sort of Silicon Valley's UFO sort of hunters. What's um, the title of it? Um, it's called, um, meet, oh man, okay, I have to check now. Uh, okay. it's called meet Silicon. I think it's called meet Silicon Valley's UFO. Yeah. Meet Silicon Valley's UFO hunters. It's okay. on vice. vice. Okay. Um, but I do talk about it in, in the book as well. Um, there, there has been a long interest, especially in California, um, where, where a lot of this sort of began, um, 
you know, UFOs um, and and extraterrestrial life and, and or inter- interdimensional life, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, is very interesting to to people, especially you know who are slightly more creative and, and and kind of brained like that, right? You know, they have that that side of the brain that that kind of functions in this odd creative world. Um, they find the possibility that UFOs are objectively real, uh, are, are made of real technology or some version of technology. Um, this is incredibly compelling to them because fundamentally they're on the cutting edge of technological development. Um, when we think about the people in California and Silicon Valley, when we think about any sort of academic who works in science um, and has the freedom to do whatever research they want, um, the idea that, that there exists some technology out there that far surpasses our technology, um, or an intelligence out there that far surpasses our intelligence is really like a holy grail of, of knowledge. And it's a holy grail of science. Um, so, so there's a huge interest there for, for them to, to engage in it. And all of that, if they can get funding to do it, that's wonderful. Um, so, so I've spoken to a few people who, work in Silicon Valley or they work in California in the university system there, Stanford University, for example, um, where they are able to acquire some private funding to engage in some interesting, you know, UFO themed research. A lot of it hinges upon um, developing new propulsion, exotic propulsion, um, that that would sort of revolutionize the way we we travel. Um, a lot of it hinges on medical science. Uh, a lot of it hinges upon genetics and and how the brain works. Why do some people um, have higher executive functioning and 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 they also exhibit signs of of um, incredible insight or intuition that that sort of goes above the normal. Um, you know, they have a gut feeling and it turns out to be right more often than not. That type of thing. And how is it all connected? Um, because ultimately, if you can master that, right? If you can master why certain people have higher executive functioning and, and if we can harness that or if, if, if why you know ufos can exhibit the ability to travel at speeds that that are impossible if we could harness that you know how could we change our world uh, and, and silicon valley and the people who, who who work in these fields generally that's that's how they think right that's how they're hardwired they're hard, hardwired to live in this 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 sort of mindscape of how can i alter my reality so much that the like, technology changes or science changes and, and we change the paradigm to something sort of new and revolutionary. Um, so I think that there's always kind of been that interest and, and the invisible college is, is sort of the loose name of, of this loose gathering of people who communicate with each other uh, about this paradigm shift that they want to create in, in various fields. That's interesting That's because it. I think the invisible college, the original one was by uh, Bacon, right? Wasn't that the one in the 16th, 17th century? Yeah, it, you know, it started off as, as um, you know, when the Enlightenment began, you know, certain topics were taboo. And, and you know, one, science itself was, was still very much a taboo subject. Um, you know, the, the, the earth um, was designed by God and the Catholic Church. And that was all, right? right, right. <laughs> we're not allowed to, to, to try and do anything about that, right? That, that was heresy. Um, and then obviously with sort of the birth and the enlightenment and the renaissance, actually, well, renaissance and then enlightenment, um, you had this shift where, where we can start using, um, uh, a more material approach to the world because the world is not just totally governed by God and whatever God wants, what happens, you know, there's, there's laws in place that, that function and, and they're very complicated and nuanced and we got to try and figure it out. But then, you know, even in the Enlightenment period, there's some weird spooky stuff going on that, that you could sort of say was occult in nature. And, um, you know, they this invisible college was designed to sort of allow scientists and, and thinkers to talk to each other without risking um, being sort of found out by their superiors or the authorities and then, you know, being fired or, you know, burned at the killed. stake. Yeah. Some, I mean, yeah. Was literally some of these people got burned at the stake. Um and then, I mean, I think in, in not just dealing with UFOs, but I do believe there's a current invisible college operating in Silicon Valley. I think I read an article recently about it, that these there are other networks of guys who are secretly sharing information, not just about UFOs. Um, right. Yeah. It's a it's a big term. Like there's invisible colleges for everything um, in every single 
you know, um, endeavor. There's invisible colleges for physics and for who knows, man, like education and social history. Like there's, there's invisible colleges cause they're just loose collections of people who bounce ideas off each other. That's really all it is. Um, but they know they do it within sort of a, uh, a safe environment where where none of that stuff is going to get out until they're ready to publish it. So the same thing occurs within ufology. Right. So it's a, I could see yeah, it's a secret group. Um you also talk about Jacques Derrida and ab- apply kind of his philosophical uh analysis to the UFO problem uh or question. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll give you a sort of the reader's digest because it can get pretty convoluted um but um Jacques Derrida is a French philosopher and and he proposed that um sort of every single idea we have um every single the way we look at the world around us is is filtered by sort of these complex constructed filters uh, that we that we sort of put over our ideas so when you look at your cell phone for example, your smartphone, you know, it's a, it's an object, it's made out of plastic and metal, but it also has a lot of other connotations to it, right? It's a device that connects you to the world, it, it does this, it, it's it, it's something you're addicted to, right? We add all these layers to, to form reality to make our, our, our smartphone become kind of what it is. So Derrida said, you know, we can start trying to strip away these layers and and it becomes a complicated process. And he said that that really there's there's kind of one issue though that that we bump into is is that as we start to strip away these layers we create more of them and it becomes more complicated because the the stripping away of layers requires us to add more layers to anyway it's called deconstruction it doesn't matter he said there's one thing though that we can't really deconstruct and it's this notion of the specter or the ghost and he he argues that when when we bump into any ideology, whether it's UFOs or whether it's the paranormal or in his case, he was talking about communism in Europe after the collapse of, of the Soviet Union, the, 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 there's a point where you can't sort of go any further. You can't deconstruct any further. You kind of get kind of stuck in this in this kind of undecidable state. It's it's sort of both things at the same time. And he used the idea of the ghost because it because a ghost is real and not real simultaneously. Uh, a ghost exists and does not exist simultaneously because for some people, you know, ghosts are real, uh, and then for others they're not. Yet as a culture, we still sort of appreciate the reality of ghosts in some way. Um, so I kind of used his his philosophy about Marxism and communism in Europe after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and I apply it to the UFO community because fundamentally that's how the UFO community functions. We're, we're kind of haunted by these ghosts of our past. Um, the UFO community is haunted by the Richard Dodies of the world, and it's haunted by the H.G. Wellses of the world, and it's haunted by the Jules Verne's and the Amazing Story comic books. Um, it's haunted by, you know, Betty and Barney Hill and it's haunted by Tom DeLong today. Um, we, we sort of create these ghosts in the UFO community that shape the narrative of the UFO itself. So UFOs become this mix of, of real and not real fact and fiction, um, objectivity and mythology kind of mixing together into this convoluted mishmash that you can never pull apart anymore. Um, and we really need to question when we think think about ufos when we think about aliens when we think about ghosts when we think about bigfoot when we think about anything paranormal um how much of that is objectively real um outside of of sort of us and how much of that is totally intertwined with us how much of that is just our stories that we've made up or created or we've been told and and how have these two ideas merged together and kind of been 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 sort of stuck and fused um and and derrida's ghost is is a perfect example of that it's this cultural reality and and objective reality that have made sort of our reality possible and and ufos kind of fall into the same category right you right. know how much of the ufo is apart from us and how much of the ufo is just part of us right that's i mean it's a great questions um I mean, you brought up Tom DeLong. We're kind of coming to the end here. We're at about 40 minutes. What are your thoughts about this current kind of other uh, group that's coming together the, to the Stars Academy? Do you have any thoughts on that? 
Well, I mean, to the stars is 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 a huge cultural force. You know, unfortunately, we don't have the hindsight. Like, we don't have hindsight yet to look back on it and say it was good or bad or in the middle. Um, so we sort of have to deal with it as it comes. Um, I, I, I'm optimistically cautious, I guess you could say. I'm, I'm romantically skeptical. Um, I, I want to the stars to be what it claims to be. You know, who who doesn't want a totally open public? Um, you know, look at the UFO phenomenon with experts who have money, who can fund all this stuff, you know, and, and, and reveal the truth and revolutionize the way we, we, we live our lives. Like the, how, how utopian is that? Um, and that sounds wonderful. And I want that to be the case, but you know, I'm also cautious because obviously that's, that's not how it works. Um, you know, anyone who starts off saying, listen, we're going to be totally open and we're going to revolutionize the way technology is going to work. And we're going to revolutionize the way we, we, we function as a species, you know, how quickly does that turn into being co-opted by, you know, corporate interests or government interests? It becomes classified or, or it goes silent and all of a sudden, you know, they disappear into the shadows and become the next Lockheed Skunk Works. So I, you know, I, I kind of get cautious with them because uh, the, these are a lot of players who who are actively involved uh, in in you know American intelligence organizations. They were or they still are, um, and and I'm not totally convinced of of the program's sort of uh, claims of being totally open. Um, however, you know I I want them to be. The, you know I've spoken to a lot of the people involved. They they come off as being very trustworthy. They come off as being very kind, um, and and open. But again, you know their training is to do that. So again, I'm I'm kind of in the middle ground. I, I I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. That's that's <laughs> the best the best verbiage for it. They've made a lot of promises, um, and 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 we're not really sure if they're going to keep them yet. Right. Well, those are excellent, excellent points. Um, we, I've covered about half the book. There's so much information in here. It's an excellent book. I had a lot of kind of aha moments, like I was surprised at some of the information. So I learned a lot reading the book. Is there anything you would like to add or anything I missed? Um, no, I, I think I, you know, I appreciate your kind words. It's really nice. Um, you know, when I wrote the book, it, it, when I was writing it, rather, it, it started off as something very different. And it quickly evolved into what it became. And um, I think that there's a lot in it that for for people who are just getting into the paranormal or the UFO, um, the UFO question, uh, it, 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 it'll hopefully save you a lot of time in the sense of being like, oh, OK, I would, you know, like that. That's actually a really good point, because I wish I had known that stuff when I first walked into it. It wouldn't have taken me six years to research a book. Um, it, you know, I, if I had known some of those things, it, it would have been very helpful to kind of see through some of the smoke and mirrors that the UFO community kind of is. Um, so hopefully it kind of pierces through the veil a little bit for people and and it, it saves you time. Um because the research is kind of done for you. Because you'll you'll kind of sit there and be like, man, all of these UFOs about, you know, the crash flying saucers. And, and, you know, I wish I had known that, you know, this is actually has a long history in comic books and, and TV and movies well before, you know, any of it actually sort of apparently happened. So, you know, it, it, it paints a, a picture that, that allows people to kind of look at the UFO world, the UFO community, the, the UFO discourse and, and answer some questions before – you have to ask them, I suppose. Well, so it, it definitely did that for me. Can, where do, can people reach you at your website? Did yeah, MJ sure. Benaz so um, the, the best place yet, yeah, the best place to, to see my work is my website. It's just mjbenias.com. Um, and I have links there to my YouTube channel. I have links there to my blog. I have links there to my articles on vice, um, as well as other articles I've written. So yeah, it's mjbenias.com is, is the best place to go. And from there you can kind of jump all around my work. All right, cool. I'm also on social media, Twitter, Instagram, yeah, that's Facebook. That's where I reach out to you is Twitter. It's mjbanias.com. Again, the book is The UFO People, A Curious Culture, published April 9th, 2019. MJ Benias, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right.